been coming to you guys with some informative videos about various things that are cause for concern and cause for sometimes worry and granddad and I thought it'd be a good idea to bring some hope and some peace and some encouragement into the mix and there's no better source of encouragement than scripture and than Jesus so you know I'd like to go into some of the scripture that I've been studying with the youth at our church um, I help with the youth I help lead the youth program at the church now so we've been doing scripture and uh, going through things and trying to understand how God's used people, how God can use us. And given the stuff we, we typically talk about, um, you know, I've found that the scripture is the best solace as far as, you know, you're worried about the world, you're, you're concerned with where it's headed. This is a reminder that this is prophesied, this is what's supposed to happen, and God has a plan. And we can do our best to, to, to bring God's will to life and to, and to live as vessels for him. But nonetheless, what's going to happen is going to happen. And the first thing I ever studied with the kids after I took um, leadership roles is Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. It's the armor of God as described by Paul in Ephesians. And I'll just start by reading it and then we're going to kind of break it down. And the first segment here is just going to be the belt of truth. We're just going to talk about truth. Where in scripture is truth referenced? A few different examples, not all of it. We don't got time for that. But <laughs> a few different places throughout scripture where truth is referenced. How can we know that God is true? How can we know his word's true? How can we know that, that he is never failing and never changing? And, and what does that mean for us? And how can we use that for our betterment and for God's glory? So... The verses are, starting in 10, Ephesians 6, 10, finally be strong. Sorry, this is the New American Standard. If you have a different version, just follow along. It's similar. Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world of forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. It's the evil day right now. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore having girded your loins with truth. And that's where we'll start. I'm going to read the rest of the scripture so you'll know where we're headed in the next five segments. Because there's six pieces to the armor as Paul describes it. But we're going to go forward with the rest of the scripture just so you get the context. Stand firm therefore having girded your waist with truth. So belts of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That completes the armor. Moving forward, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. With this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I thought it was amazing when I found out Paul wrote this from jail. The context of this is Paul is in jail writing to the church of Ephesus. He's writing a letter to the people of Ephesus saying, you know, this is, this is Christ's message. This is how you conduct yourself. This is what God wants from us. And he's in jail boldly, boldly giving this instruction and guidance from, from, from God, inspired by God. So as far as belts of truth goes, Let's just look throughout different places in Scripture where truth is referenced. And let's try to get an understanding of what truth means in God's eyes. Because we, we love to redefine words. We say, we say, I love you, and we'll say, I love these sneakers. It's the same word, but it's given two entirely different meanings. I love my truck. I love my granddad. Those two words, they're, they're the same word, but they take on two entire different meanings. So truth can play the same way. Just like I, I, Jesus loves us much more than I love my truck, truth can mean a lot of things too. Truth from our eyes is relative. People have all their own truths and live by their truths, but God's truth is the truth. And how can we find that? How can we know that? What does that mean? So let's start in Hebrews 13.8. We go back. I'm about to expose my lack of awareness of where what is. 
but uh, we'll get it done. I got I knew where that was at. I knew where Hebrews was at. <laughs> Hebrews thirteen eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Okay. So if we if we all can agree that Scripture, the Bible, all sixty six books are inspired, inerrant words of God, so it says Jesus Christ is the same today and forever. That's that statement. If you if your understanding of it is built on the fact that this is true, that is a that is a fact. That is a statement. That's a declaration. Jesus never changes. His love for us never changes. His guidance in our life is always rooted in the same in the same spirit. Um, how we're convicted to do things ought to be same. It ought to be a, there ought to be a benchmark for his conviction in your life. We know that God is true and he is unchanging and he never fails or falters. Okay. So that's a benchmark to go by. Malachi 3 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So the word consumed struck me. God again says here, I do not change. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and always. And he says again here, I do not change. Okay. So it says, therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. The word consumed, I guess, is up to interpretation. I interpreted it as not consumed by false doctrine, not consumed by the ways of the world, not consumed by confusion that man will put in your heart and Satan will put in your heart. God is the same always. We can rest in that and know that. And we read his word and we ought to feel something from it. There ought to be a conviction that follows and that shouldn't change. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be influenced or swayed by what the world says or what that you know, little evil dude on your shoulder says. God is the same. And if we understand that and we have peace in that, we shouldn't be as easily tempted and as easily swayed. Um, your own interpretation of that is equally beautiful, but it's, it's interesting to explore. And God again here says, I do not change. So I take that to mean that his, that his word and his, and his spirit does not change. So that's another truth we can have in our hearts. Numbers 23.19 Mm, 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 mm. And Numbers is a tough book to read. I recently read through Numbers and kind of studied a little bit with my girlfriend. It's the Old Testament stuff's tough, and I've been trying to eat a little more meat and drink a little less milk. And the 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 journey of the Israelites through between Egypt and and Jerusalem is a very nasty twisty and turny journey but there's a lot of truth relayed through the words of Moses here so 2319 was it yes okay God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent has he said and he and will he not do it or has he or has he spoken and he will not make it good so this, to me, made me think of prophecy. It made me think of the promises that God's made us. It made me think of all the, all the things that have come to pass and that have yet to come to pass. And if you really research all the prophecy that's laid out in Old Testament Scripture, it has come to pass, a, a, large, a large majority of it. You look at the drying of the Euphrates River. That happened within the last decade. You look at... In Isaiah, them talking about and referencing Roman crucifixion of the Savior, 700 years before Roman crucifixion was even invented. You look at all the prophecy, I think there's 30-something prophetical verses about Jesus and his, and his first coming. It's more like 130. 130. All throughout the prophetical books from, you know, you got Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and, and Isaiah. And it's it, there's so many pieces of scripture that talk foretell Jesus' first coming and it all came to pass. You probably really can't number them because there's you can find the picture of Jesus on almost every page in the Old Testament. If you look for him. Yes. And all the way up to Malachi. All the way up to Malachi 5, I think it is, saying he'd be born in Bethlehem. It happened. Um, man, you've got, you've got... Me and Granddad studied one time. If you look through, I believe it's Leviticus 16... If I'm not mistaken, Ezekiel 4, if I'm not mistaken, and 
one other place. Let me not. I'm not mind blanking. But the the prophecy that foretells when Israel would regain its independence. We did all the math on you know the punish seven folds here, and you, you owe Israel and Judah owes me this many years for turning away, and you do all the math, and it comes out to 1948.47. <laughs> it's May 15th, 1948. God told us the exact day that Israel would become an independent nation again. That's nuts. So I read that verse. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Every promise God's ever made has come true. Every single one. And there are many things that have yet to come to pass, but I believe they will. <laughs> He's never lied. Everything in this book has been vindicated, so why would I not believe it? Why would I not believe that God would do what he said he's going to do? That's peace. That is, that is an overwhelming amount of peace. No turmoil in the world can take that away. Isaiah 48. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Man. Spring's starting. I'll see all the flowers bloom and all the birds chirping and the grass growing and the and the worms crawling around and stuff and but that's that comes and goes. Here in seven or eight months, all of the stuff that's blooming and coming back to life will die again, as it's supposed to. But Jesus didn't die. He did die, but not for long. And this book has been preserved. This collection of books, God's Word, has been preserved for thousands of years and collected and, and, and kept perfect for us. That's a, that's a miracle. Think about all the, all the wars, all the, all the burning of libraries, all the lost artifacts, all the lost everything but this. This, this collection of books survived from the original writing on a scroll or rock and made it all the way to 2022 printing presses. That's insane. Our computer screens relay the same words written 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago. That's incredible. And this little blink of an eye we live, this little 70 or 80 years we're living, is nothing compared to the full picture of what God's got for us and what time actually is. That's nuts. And that's another truth we can stand on. You know, the winter comes and some people get depressed. It's just a season. You still with me, kids? Adults? Whoever's watching, you still there? Wake up! That's a truth we can stand on. Revelation 22, 13. We're going warp speed. You can think about it for yourself because I don't want to lose your attention. 22, 13. Revelation. We're going to the very back of the book, friends. And this is the words of Jesus. He's speaking to John in his vision. Red letters. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So we've talked about this several times in several different verses. A truth we can stand on is God is forever. God is unchanging. God authored everything, us included, and we're loved and cherished. That's, that's the summary of all of this. So that's where I'd like to end off because... That's where we can feel like sometimes. It's, it's tough. This world is a tough place to live in. And it's filled with obstacles. It's filled with turmoil. It's filled with struggle. But God is a resting place. His arms are a safe haven. And if you are saved, you know and feel a peace. And that can't be taken from you. And it should give you the conviction to want to explore this a little more. Because how can you not want to? So... We'll pick back up. Uh, that's the belt of truth. So that's truth we can stand on. That's some. That's a. That's a. That's a foundation for 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 what you can believe in. The doctrine you you adhere to and 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 hold on to as a rock. And so next time we'll we'll go into the breastplate of righteousness. We'll talk about where God references righteousness. Where the authors of Scripture talk about righteousness. What does that look like from God's eyes? How can we use it? How can we use it to be a light? How can we use it for our betterment, the growth of our spirit? And how can we use it to honor God? And it's pretty tough, too. It's pretty it's pretty cool stuff. So stay awake. Love you guys. Uh, you know, just keep God by your side and remember that everything's cool. 
God bless you. Put your armor on when you wake up. When you wake up, say a prayer, as you should be doing anyway. But visually picture yourself putting on armor. That's how I started my mornings ever since I studied this. When I pray in the morning, I'm putting on my armor. So that okay. Have a good day, night, evening, whatever it is. Have a good day.